Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Shir is Le'ilu Nishmas, Daniela Shena Oleho HaShalem. Bas Yeshua Falak Sheyichya, who Neshama should have an Aliyah, an Allah Yidin Ayeshia, the Kranka Arafiyah, the Gezunta Ayeshia. All Jews should be blessed with brachas and simchas, and nachas and gezunt, and all the most wonderful and beautiful things. I thought we could have a course about Rashi's commentary. Um, Rashi's commentary, uh, specifically on Chumash. I had this idea because, you know, the Parshias that we learn now, uh, you know, the stories about Yosef and the stories about Yaakov and all the rest of it, the Parshias are, are very famous, the stories are very famous, and there's so much material, there's so much madr- madrashic and spiritual insights in these stories and in these verses, in the big part of the stories and in the nuances of the stories. And of course, we have a Parsha Shir every Thursday morning, um, but it's, it's one Parsha Shir and, and it feels like every Parsha, as we run from one to the next, it feels like we leave so much behind. So I thought perhaps we could focus on some of Rashi's commentaries um, specifically throughout the Parsha, so throughout the Parsha, and see if we can find something there that is, uh, that is inspirational, that is uplifting, and that opens and that develops uh, the, the discussion. So for today, if you have a Chumash in front of you, I'd like to study with you a Rashi on Perak Memhe, chapter 45, Posik Yudbeis, Posik 12. So this, again, comes from the, 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 the section of the Parsha where Yosef has revealed himself to his brothers. He has told them who he is. He said, Ani Yosef. Uh, the brothers have gone through the shock, or they're going through the shock of this discovery, the Yosef that they wanted to kill, the Yosef that they sold into slavery, um, is now sitting in front of them. He's, he's the viceroy of, of all of Egypt. Um, and Yosef tells his brothers, Yosef tells his brothers um, that they should not be upset and they should not be bitter or resentful. Yosef tells his brothers, let not your hearts be troubled um, over the fact that you, my brothers, have sold me here. Because Yosef repeats twice. Yosef says, it was for the sake of food. It was for the sake of being able to provide food uh, during the years of hunger that Hashem has sent me, Yosef, here to this place. For food, for provision, for sustenance, Hashem, says Yosef, has sent me here in, in front of you. Um, Yosef goes on to tell the brothers that Hashem sent me here. Hashem sent me, Yosef, here to Mitzrayim to be in position where I can provide not just all of humanity with food, but even you and your families to avoid, to see to it that you avoid facing hunger and deprivation and to see to it that you not become impoverished and, and, and suffer during the time of the hunger. Hashem has sent me, Yosef, here to the land of Mitzrayim and put me in this position to be able to, to, to provide for you. And Yosef goes so far as to say to the brothers in Posuk Ches, in, Posuk, in verse 8, he says, it was not you that sent me here. It was Hashem. And Hashem has made me, elevated me to a position of power in Mitzrayim and, um, and, and a master in Paro's house. Okay. Now bear with me, we're going to read together a Rashi from Posuk Yud Beis. Yosef tells his brothers the following. Behold, says Yosef to his brothers, your eyes can see. And the eyes of my brother Binyamin, all of your eyes can see. That it's my mouth which is speaking to you. So Yosef is, is again, he's telling his, he's, he's reassuring his brothers, he's, he's, he's making the experience real for his brothers. His brothers are having a hard time wrapping their head around this reality. It's like this, this reality which has exploded out of nowhere at the moment that they least expected it. You know, everything gets, gets turned over in an instant. And Yosef tells them, look, you know, it's, again, the simple meaning of the Pasuk is Yosef tells them, look, it's, it's real. It's me. It's me. I'm talking to you. I'm Yosef. You know, Yosef showed them physical signs that he was their brother. Yosef spoke to them in Lashon HaKodesh, HaKodesh, so that they could identify him as their brother. Um, the simple meaning of the Pasuk is that Yosef is, is working. He's helping his brothers get through this 
shock of the experience. You know, in, in, in psychology, they always talk about how when a person goes through a very shocking experience, so the first part of the emotional reaction is denial, where the, person, where the, the experience is so powerful that the person can't, cannot believe it. And even if they could believe it, they cannot process it. They cannot process it intellectually. They cannot process it emotionally. They go through some, some form of denial. And this can take a while till the person is able to get through it. So again, the, the simple meaning of the Pasuk is that Yosef is um, he's, he's talking to brothers through this. He's helping them. He's like, look, guys, you know, uh, you know, it's like it's a reality. It's here. It's true. It's me. You can see it with your eyes. You can see it with your eyes. It's me. All right, Rashi says, um, Rashi actually says that, that Yosef showed them physically that he, had, uh, that he had the physical signs of having a bris milah and that he was, he, was, he was physically one of their brothers. Again, the implication here in the Posuk is that they don't necessarily recognize him by looking at him, or, or maybe they can't even think straight because they're so overwhelmed. But Yosef is making this point and he's driving it home and he's like, look, it's me and it's you and you can see it with your eyes. Okay. Now here there is an amazing Rashi. Wild, wild Rashi, wild stuff. What's bothering Rashi? Let's start with that. What's, what's bothering? What, there's a part of the Pesach, there's some words in the Pesach that Rashi's perturbed by. What's the problem? Rashi's perturbed by the fact that Yosef in his remarks, distinguishes, differentiates, divides between the eyes of the brothers and the eyes of Benjamin. Again, look back in the Pasuk. He says, V'hinei behold, e'neichem roya, it's your eyes see, ve'enei ochi Benjamin, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin. Ki piha medabra lechem, that it's me, that it's my mouth which is speaking to you. So Rashi is perturbed by this. What does Yosef want? Your eyes see and the eyes of Benjamin, my brother. And the eyes of Benjamin, my brother, see. What's the difference between the way the brothers see and the way Benjamin sees? Everybody sees. Why is Yosef harping and, and, and making special mention of the fact that Benjamin can also see him? And while we're at it, Rashi is bothered with the fact that, ben, that Yosef refers to Benjamin as my brother. They're all his brothers. All right, Benjamin was his brother from his mother's side as well. But again, how is that relevant over here? The point Yosef's making is that everybody can see that it's me. You can see that it's me. I can see that it's me. They can see that it's me. But Yomin, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar, Zvul, and everybody. So what does Yosef want here with this comment that it's not just you, the brothers, and it's not just your eyes that see, but it's also the eyes of my brother, Binyam. So it's a short Rashi. If you, again, if you have a Chumash, I'd encourage you to take a look because this is mind-blowing stuff. Says Rashi, Ve'enei ochi binyamin, Yosef makes special mention, the eyes of my brother Binyamin, Hishve es kulam yachad. Yosef equalized, he, he, uh, he equaled, he made all the brothers the same. Loimar, to say, quote, Yosef was, there was a message that Yosef was giving his brothers here. Hidden. The message is hidden in the Pesach, in the words, the eyes of my brother Benjamin. What was the message? Quote, said Yosef to his brothers, just like there is no despise, just like there is no hatred in my heart, in Yosef's heart, against Benjamin Ochi, my brother. I carry no resentment. I bear no grudge. I have no ill feelings towards my brother Benjamin for the fact that I was sold into slavery. I couldn't possibly bear a grudge against Benjamin for my being sold into slavery. He wasn't there. He wasn't part of the experience. So just, says Yosef, as I have no hatred and no animosity toward my brother Benjamin for selling me because he wasn't there, kach, in the same way, ein sino aleichem, in exactly the same way, I have no hatred against you. This was the hidden message that Yosef is telling his brothers. He says to his brothers, look with your eyes, all of your eyes should see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin. Why is he stressing that Benjamin is his brother? 
and what does he want from the eyes of it and what does he want them to see uh, w- w- with the eyes of his brother Benjamin? It was like it's Rashi says, Yosef is comparing the brothers to Benjamin and he's telling them, I feel about you the same way you feel about the, the same way I feel about Benjamin, my brother. Just like you, the brothers, understand that I have no animosity toward Benjamin, I feel that he is truly my brother. I feel that he has, there's no reason for me to be angry with him. And I'm not resentful to him for the fact that I was sold into slavery. He had nothing to do with me being sold into slavery. He wasn't even there. Says Yosef, I feel exactly the same way about the rest of you. I don't hate any of you. I don't bear a grudge. I don't carry resentment. I'm not angry. I'm not hateful. Nothing. I love you the same way I love Benjamin. I see you the same way I see Benjamin. And I want you, the brothers, to see me through Benjamin's eyes. Just as Benjamin sees me as a brother with whom there is no baggage in, our, in the history of our relationship. So says Yosef to, to his brothers, I want you to see me the same way. Let's turn, over a new, let's turn over a new leaf. Let's begin afresh. I said, Yosef, from my end, I have no anger and no hatred toward you for selling me. I feel about you exactly the same way I feel about Benjamin. This was Yosef's message, according to Rashi. Before I move on, I just want to say this. Based on this, Rashi is also explaining one more part of the Pasuk, one more part of the story, which, which when you read it, when you understand this explanation of Rashi, gives more clarity to something else that's going on. The Torah makes it clear that the brothers have a very hard time, they're struggling with, with this revelation. When Yosef reveals himself and says, it's me, I'm Yosef. The brothers have a very hard time with it. They, 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 they cannot find their words. They, they can't speak. They're in a state of shock. They're, they're, they literally back away, physically back away from him. It takes them a while until they can never even, even physically talk. It's a shocking experience for the brothers, of course. Of course. And, 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 that, and that makes sense. But what Rashi is telling us here is that there's more to the story. There's something else that was, there's, there's an additional part of the story that the brothers are struggling with, or that the brothers have to get over at this moment. And that, and that is, probably in their minds, they always feared, or they always, they always held in their minds a thought about what would happen if they ever did come face to face with Yosef. You see, the brothers knew that Yosef wasn't dead. Or at least they knew that they didn't kill him. So they knew it's possible that he's out there somewhere. They probably all these years wondered, whatever happens if we do meet him? And probably they wondered to themselves, what happens if we do meet Yosef and Yosef is in position to take revenge? They were probably kind of dreading this, carrying the secret with them in their pockets, in their hearts, their entire life. And now in one moment, boom, the genie's out of the bottle and Yosef is there and he's in their face and he's, he's the most powerful person in the world other than Paroi. And even, even, even as far as Paroi is concerned, Yosef's got a hold on him too. And somewhere in their hearts, the brothers are terrified. Oh my God, what happens now? And as if to add insult to injury, as if to add shock upon shock, not only do they have to deal with the fact that this is Yosef, their brother, the one they almost killed and instead sold into slavery, Yosef is not angry. Yosef is not bitter. Yosef is, is not bearing a grudge. He doesn't even consider his own brothers the one responsible for what happened. He tells them, it wasn't you that sent me here. It was Hashem. It's like to Yosef, his brothers are completely transparent. Insignificant in that sense. Not that his brothers were insignificant, but that their choice that they had made to sell him into slavery was completely insignificant. And so this is part of the emotional trauma, the, the, the emotional seesaw that the brothers have to grapple with and deal with all at once. All in one moment, they have to deal with discovering that Yosef is alive, that he's the ruler of all of Egypt, 
that he's going to be the one to provide them with food, that everything he dreamt about as a child is, and, and, and that they mocked and wanted to kill him for his dreams has all been fulfilled. And, and most unnerving of it all was that Yosef tells his brothers, I, I look at you the same way I look at Binyam. I have nothing against Binyamin. I have nothing against you. I have nothing against anybody. No resentment. Yosef saw everything that had happened to him in his life as something that had come completely from Hashem. Okay. This is what's written here in the Rashi. Now, of course, when you read the Rashi for the first time, it sounds amazing. It sounds romantic. It sounds so beautiful. I mean, look at that. After all Yosef had been through, he had no anger toward his brothers. He, 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 he wanted them to have no fear toward, to, toward him. He's reassuring. He's, he makes it clear to them before the brothers say boo in response that he's going to provide for them and their families. He invites everybody to come and move, move into his house, into his land. And he says, Hashem sent me here to provide for you, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. It sounds so beautiful. It sounds so spiritual. It's like, wow. Here was a man that, that didn't see himself as a victim of abuse, and he didn't see himself as an individual who, who, who had suffered at, at, the hands of, at the hands of his brothers. No, he, he, was, he was sent here by Hashem. It sounds amazing, yes? Okay. But then we start scratching the surface and we start thinking. And at, once we, as we start to think, this becomes, the story becomes actually incredibly difficult to understand. Did Yosef not realize that his brothers had almost killed him? Did Yosef not realize that his own brothers had sold him into slavery? Did Yosef not realize what a terrible family catastrophe had almost taken place here. It's okay to forgive, but it's not okay to be naive. It's okay for a person to, to you know, to, to not carry, to not bear a grudge, to not carry resentment, that, that's wonderful. But it's not okay for a person to be unaware. Yosef comes across like, like almost like this with this, childish, blissful, rose-petaled glasses, as if he's looking through the world through some weird lens and he doesn't see what's going on. Watch the truth. How did Yosef end up in Mitzrayim? Who is to blame for the fact that Yosef was almost killed by his own brothers and that in the end his brothers sold him into slavery? Who's to blame? Who's to blame for all of that? Yaakov, by showing Yosef, by showing favoritism to his son Yosef. Yosef himself, by talking about his dreams to his brothers and angering them over and over again. The brothers almost killed him. Yehuda talked them out of it by explaining to them that there would be no money to be made from killing Yosef. And the, the only way to make money out of this was by selling him as a slave. That's how the brothers were talked out of selling Yosef. Uh, excuse me. That's how the brothers were talked out of killing Yosef. And after all that, Yosef goes, ah, don't worry about it. Forget about it. Nothing happened. No resentment. Ah, I don't have anything against Benjamin. I don't have anything against you. Nothing. I forget it. Let's not even talk about it. Hashem ordained everything. Hashem, Hashem ordained everything. Of course, we're all believing Jews. We all believe Hashem runs the world. But people have to take responsibility for their actions. What in heaven's name happened here? Did Yosef really mean what he said? That he looks at the brothers the same way he looks at Benjamin? Benjamin really was innocent. Benjamin really had nothing to do with what happened. He wasn't there. The rest of the brothers were there, and they were directly responsible. 
So while it sounds so beautiful for Benjamin to say, oh, I got no, I got no ill feelings against anybody. Let's think about this for a minute. Is this the Torah telling us to quote, turn the other cheek, right? To borrow the, the expression from, from, right? From, <laughs> from you know where? Really? It doesn't matter what anybody does to you? No, your own brothers, you know, uh, they take your coat, they dip it in blood, they tell your father you're dead. Who cares? You're supposed to look at them the same way you look at an innocent bystander or somebody who wasn't even there? The Torah doesn't even say that Yosef's brothers asked him for forgiveness. It says they wept. They wept on each other's shoulders. He embraced them. They embraced him. The Torah doesn't say anywhere that they apologized. Nothing. Yosef turns the page so quickly, you can barely see it moving. And repeats over and over again. It was, Yosef says, it was Hashem. Hashem sent me here. Hashem sent me here. He even tells the brothers, it wasn't you that sent me here. It was Hashem that sent me here. And in Rashi's words, which I think brings this point to, to, to a real climax, Rashi says, he told the brothers, as far as I'm concerned, you're the same to me as my brother, Binyamin. I love Binyamin. I have no issues with him. I love you. I have no issues with you. I guess the real question here is, well, you know, perhaps Yosef was a tzaddik. Perhaps he was in that sort of a spiritual level. Perhaps Yosef lived that way. In Yosef's case, Baruch Hashem, the story has a very happy ending, of course. But let me ask you this. What if the story didn't have such a happy ending? What if the butler of the king of Egypt never bothered to mention that there was a dream interpreter languishing in a prison cell somewhere in Mitzrayim and Yosef was still in prison? What if Yosef hadn't managed to convince Paroi about the interpretation of his dreams and Paroi would have snubbed his nose at him exactly the same way Paroi snubbed his nose at everybody else who tried to interpret his dream and sent him back to the cell? Would Yosef then still be so happy to see his brothers? Would he still hug them and kiss them and cry and say to them, I have no resentment against you. Everything that happened came from Hashem. What's the Torah trying to teach us here? That when you meet people who, Rahman al may Hashem protect us, have abused you, you're supposed to turn around and say, ah, everything that happened came from Hashem. I bear no resentment against you in exactly the same way I bear no resentment against somebody who never laid a finger on me. You're all the same, you, Binyamin. I think Rashi wants us to think here very deeply about what Yosef is really telling the brothers when he compares them, when he compares them to Binyamin. And here is very briefly, I've got a couple of minutes left. Here is very briefly an insight, a perspective on how to understand this. Let's call a spade a spade. The question doesn't only apply to Yosef. The question applies to every one of us, and the question applies to every story in all of Jewish and human history. It's easy to turn around as Yosef did, or, or, or perhaps not as easy, not, not easy, but easier to turn around as Yosef did, after the happy ending, after Yosef is the most powerful man in the world and say everything that happened came from Hashem. People are very ready to talk about their mistakes and their failures after they found a way to be successful from them. Oh, every successful person is ready to turn around and tell you their humiliating stories, their challenges along the way, how they suffered, how they had to bite their way out of paper bags in order to achieve what they did. Oh, absolutely. Once you've come out on top, once you've come out on top, so easy to turn around and say, ah, my journey was fraught with pain. So easy.
But what about when there isn't a happy ending? Or when we don't see the happy ending? What about when we look around at our lives and we look at what's going on and we don't understand why Hashem allowed things to happen to us? What happens then? What about when, when Yosef was languishing in a prison cell? Yosef was a great tzaddik. Perhaps then he also felt that everything that had happened came to him from Hashem, of course. But he didn't, doesn't say it in the Torah. In fact, when Yosef meets the butler and the baker in prison and he asks them to mention him to Paroi, he tells them, I've done nothing wrong. And he tells them he doesn't belong there. The question is a much broader question. How can we, or what is the Torah's guideline? What's the mindset that the Torah wants us to have when we deal with these types of situations? Are we supposed to say to ourselves, no matter what happens, no matter what people do to us, this is the will of Hashem? Were the brothers who had sold Yosef into slavery, were they supposed to say, we fulfilled the will of Hashem? Were they getting Gan Eden for what they did? Or are people supposed to take responsibility for their actions? On the one hand, we believe that everything that happens in this world is ordained and controlled by Hashem. And nothing happens against the will of Hashem and everything is masterminded by Hashem. On the other hand, we believe that people are supposed to take responsibility for what they did. And if they've made a mistake and if they've hurt others, they're supposed to stand up and own their bad decisions, do to shuva, beg for forgiveness, and mend their ways, try to be better tomorrow. And yet in Yosef's case, we find only one side of the story. We find only from Yosef's perspective, where Yosef turns to his brothers and says, I have no resentment against you. I don't hold anything against you. Did Yosef not regret telling his brothers his dreams? The Torah doesn't say he did. So here's the insight. Here's the insight. Both are true. Both are true. Hashem runs the world. Hashem decides what happens. And human beings have free choice. And when they make decisions, they have to take responsibility for what it is that they've decided to do. Both are true. And Yosef wasn't telling his brothers that what you did was a wonderful act. Yosef wasn't telling his brothers, you're going to Gan Eden. You're tzaddikim just like Binyomin, just like Binyomin did nothing wrong. So you did nothing wrong. That wasn't Yosef's message. What was Yosef, what was Yosef saying? Yosef was telling his brothers, as far as I'm concerned, you are the same as Binyomin, meaning I'm not your victim, Yosef says. I'm not your victim. You don't decide what happens with me. You never did, and you never will. Yes, said Yosef, there was a time when you took me out of the pit, and I begged you not to kill me. It felt as if my life was in your hands. And then you didn't kill me. You sold me into slavery, and for 22 years, I haven't seen you, and I've lived with that. And you know how I was able to get through all of that? Yosef says, Yosef is educating and teaching them. Yosef says, you know how, how, how I was able to survive every moment of that? I woke up every morning and I said, my brothers are responsible for their actions. That's their cheshben. My brothers will have to face their maker. That's their calculation. My brothers will have to do tshuva for what they did. That's their business, not mine. You know what my business is? My business is to remind myself that I am nobody's victim, nobody controls, nobody decides what happens to me other than Hashem. 
And if something happened to me, if I went through something, even though it was my own brothers who put me through it, Yosef said, I knew there was a divine reason why this had to happen to me. And sooner or later, I would find it. Yosef was telling his brothers that although two people can go through exactly the same experience, from a Torah perspective, they're supposed to walk away <coughs> with two very different mindsets. The mazik, the one who inflicted the damage, the one who hurt someone else, the one who Rahman al abused or inflicted pain upon someone else, they need to do teshuva. They need to fix themselves. They need to look at themselves in a mirror and say, I did something grotesque and disgusting. I pained another human being. I have to fix that. That's their calculation. And the person to whom it happened, after he has made sure that he is no longer in harm's way, after he has made sure to follow the edict of the Torah, and taken care of himself, after he has made sure that he is no longer in harm's way and no longer being hurt by someone else, he has to then turn around and say, whatever happened, happened to me. Whatever happened to me happened because Hashem willed it so. And I am nobody else's pawn other than Hashem. I want to share with you an analogy that I heard in my yeshiva days that stuck with me to bring out this point. They say, the young, they say there's a young man, young yeshiva student, he comes to study in a yeshiva. He comes to study in the yeshiva and the dormitory is, the yeshiva's dormitory is full. There's nowhere for him to sleep. The only place available for him to spend the night is in the home of his Rosh Yeshiva. His teacher. He's very uncomfortable to sleep in the Rosh Yeshiva's house, but hey, there's nowhere else for him to sleep. So they tell him it'll take a couple of weeks, a couple of months until someone leaves. In the meanwhile, stay in the Rosh Yeshiva's house. All right. And the Rosh Yeshiva prepares him a room and comfortable place to stay. And he goes to sleep. He wakes up in the morning. The Rosh Yeshiva wakes him up. They go, they daven, they come back home for breakfast. And the Rosh Yeshiva puts out a breakfast like he's never seen in his life. Omelets and fish and vegetables and dessert and everything. Well, the young man was hungry. The food looked delicious. So he helped himself. And as he kept eating, the Rosh Hashiva keeps, keeps filling his plate, you know, take some more of this and take some more of that and eat more of this and eat more of that. And the young man feels uncomfortable. You know, the young yeshiva feels uncomfortable telling his teacher no, and the food was delicious. So he really, he really packed it in. And after he's, you know, eaten himself to the point where he's, you know, ready to burst, they bench, they go to the yeshiva, and they study all day. After a full day of study and everybody, all the boys go back to their rooms to retire for the night, this young man and the Rosh Hashiva, they head home. The boy is the Rosh Hashiva's guest for the night. And as they're walking home, the Rosh Hashiva says to him, you know, young man, he says, I need to talk to you about something. What is that? He said, I couldn't help notice the way you ate breakfast this morning. And I just, I wanted to tell you in the nicest of ways, that's not how a Jew eats. You don't eat like that. I mean, you didn't just eat, you fressed like a behemoth. You ate like an animal. Who eats like that? First of all, it's not healthy. Second of all, it's not refined. Thirdly, it's not the way a Jew eats. And, and, and you don't eat till you're bursting full. I mean, you know, you eat as much as you need. It's not healthy. You eat as much as you need and then, you know, that's it. And the yeshiva student looks at his teacher in horror and disbelief. Like, are you kidding me? You, you were the one that did that to me. But he feels very uncomfortable to say anything, so he keeps his mouth shut. All right, very embarrassed, very uncomfortable. They go home, they wish each other good night, they go to sleep, then they wake up the next morning, they daven, they come home for breakfast. Same story all over again. 
the Rosh Hashiva puts out fish and cheese and this and eggs and vegetables and that. Anyways, the kid is hungry and the food is delicious and the Rosh Hashiva keeps piling the food on his plate. Here, have some of this and have some of that and eat this and eat that. And he's embarrassed to say, no, thank you. But he's uncomfortable because of the speech he got last night. Anyways, the food is good. He starts eating and before you know it, he fills himself and eats everything in sight upon the insistence of his teacher. And they go back to the yeshiva to study all day and on the way home that night, the Rosh Hashiva gives them the same speech. The Rosh Hashiva says, that's how you eat. Fair. A Jew doesn't eat that way. A little bit. Take, you know, what you need. It's not healthy the way. You, you filled yourself almost to the point where you're about to burst. Who eats that way? And the kid is so embarrassed and so confused. What's going on here? He doesn't know what to say. The next morning again, the Rosh Hashiva fills him and puts him a, 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 a pile of food on his plate like this. And the teacher keeps insisting, eat more, eat more. And so every day this goes on, back and forth. In the morning, the Rosh Hashiva feeds him. And at night, the Rosh Hashiva scolds him for eating too much and for eating too fast. And for being too involved, for being too coarse in the way he eats. Until the young man loses his nerve and he says, Rebbe, I don't know what you want from me. You're driving me nuts. In the morning, you feed me. At night, you scold me. In the morning, you insist that I eat. At night, you insist that I don't eat. What, what, what do you want from me? You want me to eat? I'll eat. You want me not to eat? I won't eat. Make up your mind. What are you, schizophrenic? <laughs> and after the bocher, after the young man, you know, finally vents his frustration from this couple of days of being pulled in different directions, the Rosh Hashiva waits till he calms down and says to him, my dear student, it appears you don't understand what's going on here. He says to the young man, I wear two hats with you. During the day, I am your teacher. During the day, I am your guide. It's my job to be your spiritual, to be your spiritual teacher. During the day, I teach you how to live as a Jew and how to grow as a Jew. He says, when we're at home, I'm not your teacher, I'm your host. As a host, I'm going to offer you the sun, moon, and stars. I'm going to do my best job to be your host. But as a teacher, I'm going to teach you to eat in more measured ways. I'm going to teach you to hold back. I'm going to teach you not to eat everything you see. As a host, I'll insist that you eat more and more. And as a teacher, I'll teach you to hold back and not give in to every temptation in front of you. As a host, I'll tell you I'm offended if you, if you don't eat my food, and I will be. And as a teacher, I'll tell you, <coughs> don't eat everything you see, it's not the right way. I wear two hats, and I'm going to insist on wearing them both well. Yosef wore many hats. But the one hat, Yosef wore the hat of provider for his brothers. Yosef wore the hat of king of Egypt. Yosef wore the hat at times of being a slave. Yosef wore the hat at times of being accused falsely. Yosef wore the hat of an orphan. Yosef wore the hat of a dreamer. Yosef wore the hat of his father's favorite child. Yosef wore many hats and he wore them all with grace and with elegance. There was one hat that Yosef refused to put on. There was one role that Yosef refused to play no matter what came his way. Yosef refused to define himself in one costume. And you know what that hat and you know what that costume that Yosef never wore is? Never, ever did Yosef allow himself to be a victim. No way. No matter what happens and no matter what happened, Yosef faced obstacles from every, it wasn't only his brothers, his brothers did, got the whole thing rolling. But after that, it was the wife of Poitifar who falsely accused him and his master who falsely imprisoned him and the butler who forgot about him for two years while he languished in prison. Yosef went through it all. And through it all, he said, whatever happens comes from Hashem. 
So no, Yosef wasn't saying that the brothers are as innocent as Benjamin. Yosef wasn't saying that the brothers have no blood in their hands in the same way Benjamin does. Yosef wasn't telling the brothers what to do for their own tshuva program between you and Hashem. Yosef said, that's your business, not mine. You know what Yosef was saying? You, my dear brothers, have no control over me. You didn't decide my fate. The wife of Poitifar didn't decide my fate. The butler and the baker didn't decide my fate. Pare Melech Mitzrayim didn't decide my fate. Nobody controls me in exactly the same way as I don't look at Binyamin and say, what did you do to me? I don't look at you either and say, what did you do, you do, what did you do to me? You, my dear brothers, did nothing to me. Whatever happened to me came from Hashem. It's the Torah's way of teaching us this. No matter what a person faces in life, a person always has to... I had a teacher who used to love to say, God, God takes care of those who take care of themselves. There is wisdom to it in the sense where none of this is intended to let us off the hook. It doesn't mean that we go about and sit around all day and do nothing and wait for Hashem to take care of us. It doesn't mean any of that. Of course not. What it means is that we don't see ourselves as pawns in someone else's life. We don't see ourselves as, as, as out, and we don't see our destiny as being determined by other human beings. Chas v'sholem. Our destiny in the end is determined by Hashem. Yosef said, you know why I ended up here? Because that's what Hashem wanted. If it hadn't been you, Yosef said to the brothers, it would have been someone else. I needed to end up here in Mitzrayim to control the world. That was my destiny. I was going to end up here no matter what. You, the brothers, made some very bad choices. You, the brothers, you have your own chupa, you have your own tikkun to do. That's nothing to do with me. That you'll do and you'll do chupa between yourselves and Hashem and Yom Kippur. You'll worry about that then. Perhaps the brothers should have asked Yosef for Mechilah. Perhaps they did. The Torah doesn't say they did. I don't know. But if they would have come to Yosef and if they would have asked him for forgiveness, Yosef would have, said, Yosef would have told them, I, forgive, I forgave you a long time ago. Why? Because I think, because Yosef thought that what the brothers did was good. Yosef said, what you, whether what you did is good or bad, you're, you sort that out with Hashem. You, you, stand in front of, you stand in front of a mirror and you ask yourself whether what you did is right or wrong. That's not on me. I have to take responsibility for myself. I have to ask myself what kind of mindset do I carry through life? And I choose the mindset, said Yosef, of a man who believes that every step of the way, Hashem chooses my fate. And that's why Yosef was a king. And that's why his brothers bowed down to him. And that's why in the end, the whole world bowed down to him. Because Yosef was a man, an individual who saw himself, his fate in the hands of Hashem. And he knew that nobody else could control that. On a philosophical level, it's still difficult to understand how do we put all this together? Do human beings have control? Do human beings not have control? Does Hashem control the world? Does Hashem not? How do you put this all together? The Ramam writes that this mystery is beyond the scope of a human being to understand. Yosef wasn't trying to solve philosophical problems here. Yosef was teaching us the greatest message and the most empowering lesson that we can, any of us can carry in any of our lives. And that message, it's literally in Yosef's words. Yosef told his brothers, whatever happened to me from my perspective, came to me from Hashem. My fate was never in your hands. As far as I'm concerned, everything that, all of this was done by Hashem for my benefit. May Hashem bless us all with this type of mindset of Yosef, with this type of inner strength of character, with this type of, of, of connection to Hashem. And may we, as Yosef did, be able to always see in a revealed way the good that comes to us, unfortunately, from the challenges we face in life. 
But even along the way, let's remember that ultimately, Bashert is Bashert. Hashem controls the world, and we are in Hashem's hands alone, and no one else's. Have a wonderful Shabbat.